MJF had his re-bar mitzvah to start Dynamite, and as a man who has only had one singular bar mitzvah, I thought this was absolutely terrific. Also, hello, welcome to Ups and Downs, the show with me, Simon Miller, where we review professional wrestling. And sometimes I dance. Wanna know why? Because you can't stop me. That's right, everyone coming in these comments going, Simon, you're too positive. Oh yeah? Well, I'm gonna take those feelings and I'm gonna be even more positive than ever. <laughs> everyone just calm down. Maxwell had his kipper and tullet on as well. So now deep down in my tum tum, I'm never gonna be able to help this guy because it was too damn good. Although he then actually did make a good attempt at this because we were in Canada. He got on the microphone and said, <laughs> you guys are such a bunch of idiots. You actually think Brett was better than Sean? And everyone booed him. He also talked about losing his virginity at his original bar mitzvah when Harvard Nagila played. And a bunch of people came down to celebrate it. They lifted Maxwell up in the air on a chair. I was having the best damn time of my life. I don't think that was the point of this segment, but I don't give a flub. I was always going to hate whoever interrupted, and it was Jungle Boy, but oh my gosh, did we build this. Because straight after Sammy Guevara came out, and straight after Darby Allen was here too, and they all looked at MJF, and in unison said, we want a title shot. So you can see what we're doing here. We're taking the pillars of All Elite Wrestling, we build it. When we cut back to Friedman 2, he was wearing this amazing fuzzy hat, so he totally won this day. Although Jack Perry then got on the microphone and said, look, every time I've faced you, you have cheated to win, and you just walk around AEW doing whatever the hell you want. I have been churning and I have been battering away on the likes of Dark and Elevation, so now, damn it, I deserve a shot at you. Perry also thinks that the company revolves around him, and Max was like, yes, it does, that's why I do whatever I want. When Sammy Guevara popped up and he was like, look, if you don't all shut up, this is not only going to be a rebar mitzvah, it's going to be a recircumcision. I was like, what are you going to do, Sam? You're going to take the foreskin and you're going to put it back on the penis? That's not a thing, come on. He then talked about how he too had been smashing it on the indie scene before he got to AEW, but originally he had just been told, oh man, you're just gonna be Chris Jericho's bumping guy. But then he was able to break through. He is a multiple time TNT champion. So now he wants the big gold belt. Freeman obviously took shots at everyone, including saying to Guevara, well, maybe you should go backstage and fall out with someone else. When it was Darby Allen's turn to talk, he basically said the same thing. He talked about dropping out of film school and going to the Buddy Wayne Wrestling Academy because he knew in professional wrestling he could be himself and he never wants to be anywhere else. And this is why he's a bad businessman because he told Tony Khan, I shall never leave All Elite Wrestling because it gives me what I need, which is essentially creative freedom. He also said that he was going to beat MJF's head in with a skateboard if he didn't get what he wanted. I was like, wait a minute, isn't that blackmail or extortion? I think it's definitely one of the two. Someone arrest him. MJF then totally lost his cool and removed his sunglasses and holy crap, you could see the effects of that Iron Man match and it made you go, <laughs> somebody kicked his ass. When he started to insult Sammy for being a proposal machine and said all of you are just in daddy daycare because whereas I stand alone, you all have to go team up with some wrestling legends because otherwise you wouldn't have made it. He then pie-faced Jungle Boy who smacked him and all of a sudden we had a massive brawl, including Maxwell Jacob Friedman, going into the table where the cake was. Because if you have some kind of wrestling party and you have some sugary treats, that has to happen. But now look what we can do. We can do the four-way, we can do some singles matches, we can do variations of. This is exactly the type of thing that AEW should be doing because it made it feel completely different from anywhere else. And they could have had a flag that says, oh man, well, you want to see some all-elite wrestling talent? You've got to come here, obviously. So I loved all of this and it got me excited. So once again, I was dancing again and nobody should make me dance. I don't know what the hell I am doing. I am giving it an up. And speaking about continuing this on too, it was then the Dark Order versus the Backball Combat Club. And this rocked as well. It was also Hangman Adam Page, Evil Uno and the returning Stu Grayson, who's also Canadian. So everybody went crazy for him. And given his performance here, he was rehired, I don't think that would be a bad thing at all. Will Uta and Grayson also kick things off here, and the BCC surely have to be heels now, because they just spawn around like, oh man, we're villains and we don't like anyone, and we're gonna try and get blood out of people's skulls. If anybody told you that in the real world, oh, what do you like to do, Steve? Oh, I like to get blood out of people's heads. You'd be like, <laughs> nobody talked to Steve. I swear Uno also bit Wheeler Uta at one point, I suppose that is the way to get things done. And even though the Dark Order were rocking and rolling for a little bit, once again, the BCC came together and they were like, we can use our Captain America powers of three. And all of a sudden they were kicking ass. I mean, Claudio Castagnoli just sagat uppercut and Grayson right in the face when they gave him a triple spike pile driver. You don't give anybody a triple spike pile driver. And then when they were back in the ring, Mox went, oh, I'm gonna do it again. 
everyone was being pal drove. Of course, the big build up here was to get the hot tag to Hangman Adam Page, and he did do that and went wild. And eventually we got back to the whole John Moxley versus Hangman Adam Page, because I presume at this point they're gonna be like Batman and the Joker. Doesn't matter who wins, doesn't matter who loses, they're destined to do this for an eternity. Wheels wasn't a fan of this at all though, so he took the ring bell and he smacked Adam Page right in the head, which of course took him out of the game, which is when Evil Uno and Stu Grayson basically had to be a couple of superheroes there, because they were like, well, we're down when it comes to the wrestling match but we're charging in anyway. They put up quite the fight as Evil Uno was even able to hit John Moxie with the paradigm shift as they also hit their Mortal Kombat combo. And this led to an awesome near fall that Yuta broke up at the last minute when everybody was going for the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment. Surprise roll up. Sadly though, it was around about this point that Stu Grayson forgot that Claudio played Street Fighter all the time. He got uppercut and went right into the Moxley choke. And as we have said a thousand times, if you can't breathe, you can't wrestle. This was done. Blackpool Combat Club won. They carried on this assault until the rest of the Dark Order came down to make the save. So once again, you cannot convince me that John Moxie and his buddies aren't heels. But also, there is more to this when we get to the end of the show. And it gets even better than this. But still, up. Quick promo with Juice Robinson after this as he told Ricky Starks, you're not going to do anything after I beat you up last week. And look, I think this feud is going to be really good. It's just a shame we didn't heat Juice Robinson up beforehand. Although, to be fair, if you do heat up Juice, it goes all warm and horrible. So maybe this was the right thing to do. And then, everybody was wrong. Look at that. Because obviously we had been promoting the whole week that it was going to be Jade Cargill versus a Canadian. And everyone was like, well, it's definitely Ty Valkyrie. I know this, I have done my research. And then it wasn't Ty Valkyrie. Instead, it was Nicole Matthews, who is actually quite a hot prospect in wrestling. But of course... Can't face Jake Cargill in 2023. She got in there, she got pump kicked, she got hit with the jaded. One, two, three. This was over in around about 10 seconds. Now, I would have thought that was a massive shame given how much we had promoted this, but actually it was a swerve on top of a swerve so we could give you a little bit of a swerve. Because Jade Cargill was being all like, oh man, Canada, is that all you've got? When she turned to Rennie Paquette and was like, wait, you're from here. Maybe I should beat you up when all of a sudden some brand new music started to play. And yes, then it turned out we were correct. Tyre Valkyrie debuted in AEW. She got a pretty damn good reaction as well, and after some shenanigans, she gave Layla Gray the jaded so she could go, ha ha, Cargill, I just stole your move. And what we need to do now is we need to make this a proper feud. And also, man, if you want to have Tyre Valkyrie win the TBS Championship and break Jade Cargill's streak, I don't think that's a problem. In fact, I think that would open the division and allow you to have more fun. But I do think this was very good because having Ty in the company is only going to bolster this division. She's a very good wrestler. Wasn't treated very well at all in NXT. I'm giving it an up. But again, let's stretch this one out. Ricky Starks was then responding to Juice Robinson and said, man, it would be great to be in the Bullet Club if it was 2015. I thought that was a good line. It also means that this program is ready to go when we did get a hype video for Shazam. And look, fair play to AEW, go and get that cash. It also led to something I've been quite excited about all week, the debut of QTV, which is QT Marshall's new venture. Now, cannot lie, I thought this was pretty damn good. It's basically ripping on TMZ, which did make me chuckle. But also we had exclusive footage here of Aaron Solo breaking into Wardlow's car and stealing the TNT Championship. Now, what I think has happened here is that some idiot did break into Wardlow's car for real and AEW went, well, look, we're a wrestling promotion. Why don't we retroactively fit this around the story? But now I'm not 100% sure. So I'm either being worked or I'm on the ball. But it's always great when a wrestling company does this because when you don't know, just allows you to buy in. Everybody was also insulting Wardlow during this, including, I think, QT saying, oh man, he's nothing but a crappy Batista. I was like, oh man, that is shots fired. When we basically learned that powerhouse Will Hobbs is bringing back the TNT Open Challenge. Good. I quite like this though, because it was proper sports entertainment and there's nothing wrong with sports entertainment. It just means we can do silly things and make the audience enjoy what we are doing. I'm actually quite excited to see where this goes giving it up. And then AEW got me again. Because it was Jeff Jarrett versus Orange Cassidy for the international title. And for some reason down in my tootsie toes, I just totally believed that Jeff Jarrett was going to win. I mean, we were in Canada. These fans would have gone crazy. And we honestly did so many tricks to make us think it was going to go this way. Then it didn't. The absolute greatest part of it, though, is that as Orange Cassidy was coming to the ring, 
he saw somebody in the crowd dressed as the shock master and he gave him a fist bump. So listen to me. I am the best knowledge of professional wrestling, whatever that means. Hire the shock master. I mean it. I don't care how you put the costume and have him run wild through AEW. I'm going to be dead one day and I need this in my life. Back in the ring, of course, we were mucking around with Orange Cassidy putting his hands in his pockets while Jeff Jarrett did the strut. And if you'd never watched wrestling before, you tuned in for the first time, you'd be like, man, these two absolutely have to be on drugs. Of course, there was a story here too, because last week, Jared hit Orange with the guitar, so his leg was injured. So as soon as Double J could go after it, that's what he did. But any time the piece of fruit tried to get back on top, obviously Sanjay Dutt was running distraction. And I was like, man, you are an absolute piece of trash. The two fought into the crowd for a little bit, and when they got back to ringside, Satnam Singh grabbed Orange Cassidy and he threw him in the ring like he was a child. Now, if you have a child around you right now, absolutely do not hurl them. But if you would like to see what this would look like, I present you with Exhibit A. Jarrett then decided to choose Chaos because he was pretending he was going to lock in the figure four when instead he locked in the sharpshooter. And this Canadian crowd went absolutely crazy. So I'm giving a round of applause for Jeff Jarrett. I was wrong, you were wrong, we were all wrong. He has been one of the best hires of the last 12 months. He's great. Orange was able to reverse this into a sharpshoot of his own, which of course is when Tony Khan ran out and went ring the bell. That did not happen. But then Sanjay Dutt was helping him again. He basically allowed Jeff Jarrett to get to the ropes. I could not believe it. It was just pure shenanigans after this as the referee got bumped and Jeff Jarrett had his guitar before you could sing My Old Man's a Dustman when Aubrey Edwards ran out and she was getting into Jeff again because of course last week they had fallen out too. It also allowed Cassidy to hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment but that didn't work which is when he pulled an Eddie Guerrero because he saw that Satnam Singh had the guitar, he tapped Aubrey on the shoulder he then kind of nonchalantly threw himself on the floor, but this was enough for Aubrey. And she said, sorry, Satnam, and you, Sanjay, you out of here. Cassidy was also limping all over the place here because he was telling a story, which is when Jay Lethal ran out. He had the Golden Globe. He twonked Orange Cassidy right on the head. And I tell you, when Jeff Jarrett pinned him, I totally believed it. This is when Trent finally ran out. And I was like, where have you been? You must have been watching all of this from the back. What took you so long? And when Jeff went for the stroke, Orange Cassidy was able to turn it into the orange punch and he pinned him for the one, two, three. He is still your international champion. And do you know what this was? F-U-N. That's right, we're going Sesame Street. It was just fun. I don't understand how anybody could watch this and not have a good time, unless you're a negative Nancy. But do you know what? You're allowed to be a negative Nancy. Nancy, I salute you, but I'm a positive Pete, and I'm giving it an up. We then got this great music video with the acclaimed, although I do have to say we need to get them in a mega feud soon, because they're so over at the moment, they're so hot right now, and we don't want them to lose their momentum. But again, they are very funny and they are very entertaining, so this was good. Right after this too, the outcast came to the ring. I'm not talking about Andre 3000 and Big Boy, although that would be awesome. Instead it was Ruby Soho, Tony Storm and Soraya, and Ruby grabbed the mic and said, the grass was meant to be green in AEW until two bitches turned up and pissed on the grass, and no, they're not house trained. What? Hi there. Welcome to another episode of Nobody Talks Like That with me, Reginald Arthur. And indeed, I have been informed that this was said on AEW Dynamite. Because Ruby Soho mentioned that the grass was meant to be greener in AEW when a couple of bitches turned up and pissed on the grass. Now, I'm happy to tell you as a speaking expert that if you say that in any other walk of life, or you say that in reality, people aren't going to want to be your friend anymore. Because... I'm happy to tell you, nobody talks like that. Good night, be safe. So right, it made a little bit more sense because she was all like, there wouldn't even be a women's division without us. I was like, actually, that's not true. You could book my mum and my auntie, and while they would have a bunch of terrible matches, it would still count as a division that featured women. Also, you absolutely do not want to book my mum, because she still thinks wrestling is called WWE. So she's going to turn up to AEW, and she'll mention those three initials, and everybody will come at my mum at Twitter. Don't get mad at my mum on Twitter. How do we get here? Soraya also called the fans twats, which really made me laugh, especially if you're from Britain. And apparently she did get fined for this, but my word did it get me. When Tony Storm was like, all right, I'm going to add to this. You know, I was a bit disrespected when you called me the interim champ. 
And I was like, yeah, that's fair enough. You also mentioned how they're having a great time taking out rookies such as Sky Blue, Willow Nightingale, Riho, Britt Baker, and Jamie Hayter. And as soon as she has said those last two names, out came Britt and Jamie. So they must have been backstage going, I swear, if they say our names once, we're going to be super mad. And they said it, they turned to the audio guy, they went, push play, and here they came. And this was absolutely stupid because it was not good wrestling maths. And of course, they got taken out with the Destination Nowhere and the Storm Zero. And I was a little bit like, well, that served you right, didn't it? All the other folk mentioned then came out to leveling the playing field, though. And I actually thought this was really good, especially because now, if you want to do some five-on-five -five warfare, you totally can. And you know there's a little match called Blood and Guts. I know I keep going on about it, but we built all of these foundations. Why not finish the house? There's also this great bit where Jamie Hayter acknowledged Riho as Roman Reigns melted down somewhere, whereas Britt Baker was a little bit more hesitant, because of course those two have some history. So I am massively intrigued to see what we do with this long term, because I guess you could go in multiple directions. But if we can get this Jade Cargill and Tyre Valkyrie program going and add in this tool, well, I think there's a lot of good here. I am giving it an up. And then Matt Menard and Angelo Parker won the evening. Just like that. Because they were chatting about the Acclaim video from earlier and said they found it so entertaining, <laughs> it made their nipples hard. And I was like, well, that's it. Somebody give them a prize. They also told Caster Bones and Danny Ass to watch Rampage because they're going to give them a taste. So we still are building something here. And I mentioned that I wanted the Acclaim to have a mega feud. This will work for me because that magic word is about to come up again. It will be... Blah, blah, blah. Then got a quick promo from Phoenix who said that he is going to be taking on powerhouse Will Hobbs for the TNT Championship on Rampage. I was like, Phoenix, man, he's going to absolutely murk you, although I do think that's a cool match. When we got to our main event, flub me sideways, this was amazing. Because not only was it the House of Black versus the Jericho Appreciation Society versus the Elite for the trio's titles, but it also had a cliffhanger ending that made me shout out loud, well, now I'm going to have to tune in next week. The reaction for Jericho and Omega 2 when they made their entrances was so bonkers. You have to go out of your way to see this. And the crowd was also so into this match. I just sat there and I was like, I tell you, having such a good time. It's like a roller coaster of joy. The House of Black started this strong off too as they threw some people around when Chris Jericho did make the tag. And this is when Kenny also made the quick tag too. And just when they were about to fight, the House of Black cut them off which was going to become a story for the evening. And then Chris Jericho and Brody King were then trading off, and Jericho actually went, well, I know how I can take you down, big boy. I'm going to give you some chops, and you can just figure out who won that battle. Brody murked him. Amazingly, he was able to get back on top where he tried to break the back of Malachi Black, and given that this left an opening for the JS, they all did their pose. They are wonderful idiots. Nick Jackson then tagged in the Nick Jackson things, and honestly, he's so underrated as a wrestler because he's so good. And he was having some real momentum here until he was introduced to Buddy Matthews' knee. I mean, he smacked him right in the skull. That looked like it sucked. It also led to the Omega Hot Tag, who was just smashing out Snapdragons and Polish Hammers. And I love that he does those. It makes me happy. And this Snap Hurricane Rana he did on Matthews was as pretty as a picture. We then finally got back to Kenny and Jericho, and this time the House of Black tried to stop it, but they couldn't. And when they went into hockey fight mode, this crowd went absolutely crazy. So at some point in the future, we have to revisit this feud, because just go and use your ears, people want it. It also kind of ended too when Omega went for the V-trigger, but Chris Jericho was able to lock in the walls of Jericho. I was like, man, I didn't see that coming. Later on, when Jericho gave Kenny Omega the V-trigger, he sold it like death, these two just click. The Bucks broke all this up though when they had a super kick party when Brody King came back in the ring. He hit these clotheslines that were so stiff, it's like he was a corpse. Daniel Garcia and Sammy Guevara then had their moment when they not only hit a superplex, but they were hitting Spanish flies from the top row. And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot these two are crazy. But all of a sudden this went even more nuts because we cut to the backstage area. We saw that the Blackpool Combat Club and the Dark Order were still fighting as Excalibur just throw in there. Oh, by the way, Evil Uno has gone to the hospital. And I was like, well, why are we talking about that? But as it turned out, it was going to tie into the finish. The Bucks then went for the Meltzer driver, but Jericho cut that off with this amazing amazing code breaker when also Sammy Guevara was back and hit this pitch a perfect shooting star press and just when it looked like the JAS was going to win Brody King broke it up. I then had to go have a nap because I was absolutely exhausted when I came back Chris Jericho had Floyd the baseball bat and he smashed Brody with that one and all of a sudden Jericho got smacked with that massive kick by Malachi Black and he fell out the ring. And this is when Daniel Garcia just got in there and maybe I missed something but I was like you ain't the legal man pal. The House of Black hit the Donner's Inferno and they got the one, two, three. And honestly, even if it was a mistake, it could be on me, obviously. 
Who cares? This was such a good triple threat tag match. I just had the best time. It's like my birthday, Christmas, and Hanukkah coming together. It is getting it up. Jake Hager was worried for his friend, so he ran into the ring, and of course the House of Black beat him up, and I was like, Jake, much like the people earlier, you deserve that, because what were you gonna do? You didn't even have a weapon. But all of a sudden, this fight between the Blackpool Combat Club and the Dark Order spilled towards ringside, and I was like, good grief, this is nuts. The problem was, though, without Evil Uno, it meant the Dark Order were a man down, so all of a sudden, Hangman Adam Page found himself in the ring by himself as the BC started to creep up on him. I mean, they didn't do that. It wasn't amateur dramatics. This is when AEW went story time, though, because the elite got in the ring. They were backing up the cowboy. The BCC had to bail. But Angman Adam Page didn't know about this because he was focused on his enemies. And just as he was about to turn around and see them, do you know what happened here? Dynamite had to go away. The show was over. So it basically left you going, well, you want to know what happened afterwards? You better tune in next week. The fans absolutely exploded, and now I have all the questions. I mean, are the Elite and Hangman back together? Are they going to have a big hug? Are they going to kiss and make up? We don't know. But what we do know is that every single other time we have done this narrative, it has been top-tier brilliant stuff. So this really was excellent, because the angle was so well executed. I am going to give it its own separate up. And also... This dynamite was fire. I admit it, sometimes I kind of go through the show, I'm like, well, it's not great, but there's nothing really bad about it, so I'm not going to hand out downs for no reason. But this one was just brilliant. So bravo to everyone involved, and it is getting it up. Now, of course, please do click one of the videos on the screen. It could be another ups and downs, so make sure you support the channel and see more of my bald head. And like the video, share the video, subscribe, and leave a comment below saying, Simon, you don't know what you're talking about. Mum and Dad, it's good to see you again. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you very much for joining me as always. Now, that thing has happened again. I've damn got glue on my hands like Brock Lesnar and Omos from Raw. Now I've got to walk around like this all day. It's not going to be good. Goodbye.